Since Star Wars, pretty much every kid knows what lasers are capable of. In reality, they are used in many fields and industries, like research, medicine and manufacturing, and also in additive manufacturing, as you can see here on the video. My name is Daniel and welcome everybody to today's Tech Talk about lasers and optics with my colleague Anush here. Anush, welcome to the show. Hello Daniel. The basic principle of stimulated emission was postulated by Albert Einstein more than 100 years ago. Anush, can you tell us a little bit more about stimulated emission and how uh, the basic of laser technology really works? He worked on a quantum theory for thermal radiation when he postulated a quantum process named stimulated emission. Stimulated emission uh, requires a quantum system in an excited state. Um, an example is uh, sketched here. You have an electron that is in a state with a higher energy and can decay back to a state with a lower energy. This decay can take place radiatively. This means a photon is emitted, which takes away the energy difference between both states. So the photon energy is equal to the energy difference between E2 and E1. In the absence of a photon, this decay takes place spontaneously. If another photon is present with an energy that is equal to the energy difference, it can stimulate the emission process. That means the presence of this photon increases the probability of the emission of another photon. The additional photon that is emitted then has the exact same phase and direction of the photon that stimulated the process. So in a sense you have created a copy of your original photon or you have amplified uh, the number of photons that are present. Energy gap uh, determines the wavelength at which the laser can operate. Uh, the important requirement is that you are able to prepare your system with the uh, majority of all elements in an excited state. You must be able to really efficiently excite your systems because if you have only a few number of excited states. What happens if you then um, emit a stimulated photon, it will be immediately absorbed by another quantum system which is not excited. Okay, I think we can stop here um, because there's a lot of literature um, where you can find a lot of details and fundamentals of laser technology. Let's focus more on additive manufacturing and um, especially on powder bed processes for plastics and metals. So Anosh, why do we choose lasers for these processes? In general, lasers have a number of quite useful properties for powder bed additive manufacturing. They can be focused to a relatively small spot size. This is important for achieving a high part resolution. A small spot size means that you have a small volume uh, that is melted by the laser and a small volume can also cool down quickly. And this avoids having a large uh, puddle of melt where powder sticks to it. Second property is that lasers can be deflected by mirrors. And you can make the mirrors very small so that you can have a fast deflection which allows to scan uh, your powder bed quickly with a laser. The third property is that lasers can be modulated fast. So this means you can switch a laser fast on off. And this is also important if you want to have a good part resolution. If you uh, scan a track over the powder bed, then you want uh, to have sharp edges where the laser uh, switches on off very quickly. And before we were talking about uh, wavelengths of um, the laser. So this is also important for the absorption wavelength of the material? Uh, in general it is. Uh, the wavelength plays a very important role for the uh, laser material interaction. So in general the wavelength uh, decides whether you have a, a photochemical re reaction like in stereolithography or a thermal reaction uh, which is mainly used for powder bed additive manufacturing. For polymers it is important 
that the uh, laser wavelength matches the absorption wavelengths of the polymer material. The CO2 laser is in that regard in many cases a very good match because most polymers absorb strongly in the infrared. About metals and uh, their absorption behavior? Um, in metals you have to also look on the uh, uh, reflectivity. Most metals uh, tend to reflect more at longer wavelengths in the infrared and tend to reflect less towards shorter wavelengths like the near-infrared, visible or ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm. For the reflection, um, you have also to take into account that powdered material re uh, tend to uh, reflect less than a bulk surface. So that means that uh, in this case for all powders, it's not that relevant, the absorption wavelength of the material. It turns out that it's actually not that relevant. Once the material is powdered, it pretty much absorbs very well uh, the laser radiation. Okay, okay, interesting. Let's talk about how do we bring the laser light on to the powder bed. So you brought a couple of optical components with you. So can you explain how these components interact with each other in order to bring the spot onto the powder bed? Let's start with the scanner mirror. This this is a, a scanning mirror, a so-called galvanometric mirror. So you see here, this is the uh, mirror part. This one is a mirror coated with gold, which is used for CO2 lasers. It is uh, movable and it has a number of magnets on its axis. And in this uh, casing, there's also a number of coils. And when you send a current through the coils, the magnetic field uh, makes the mirror move and you can do that with very high precision uh, which allows you to uh, deflect uh, the laser beam uh, about an angle. Now you can take two of those scanning mirrors, put them in a housing like this and you have a scanning unit. Okay. Here you can see both mirrors, they're installed very close together and here's the entrance for the laser. And you go in with the laser beam. The laser beam is deflected by the first mirror around one axis and then deflected by the second mirror um, about another axis. By using two axes, you can deflect the laser in a full cone. Now the scan head is mounted on top of a scanning objective which I have here. Something like this. It sits very tightly on top of it. And the purpose of the scanning objective is to focus the laser light on the powder bed plane. These are the essential parts of a laser uh, scanning system typically used uh, uh, for powder bed additive manufacturing. You have a laser here. You have uh, the scanning mirrors in one direction, a second scanning mirror in the other direction, and this is the uh, scan lens, uh, which is a so-called F theta lens. And the scan lens fulfills two functions. First, it focuses the laser light to a small spot size, and the second function is that it always focuses in a plane. If you take an ordinary lens, you would focus uh, not in a plane, but on a spherical surface. Okay. So you would defocus if you increase the angle of, of deflection. The theta lens prevents that. This was a very interesting tech talk about lasers and optical components. So thank you very much, Anush, for this very detailed and uh, comprehensive um, explanation. So, see you soon at the next Tech Talk and goodbye. It's been nice talking to you, Daniel. Goodbye, everybody.